Welcome to Intoxicated Masculinity, where we talk about drinking culture, pop culture, and politics, and other stuff, too. Um, again, we're on our, uh, our, our holiday season, so we're planning a little more loosey goosey and we're finishing off our little chit-chat episode we started last week. Joining me, as always, and as last week, is Brandon. How's it going, my people? Kale. Hi. And I'm still Mike. Um, Brandon, what are you drinking tonight? Or still tonight? Or last night? Or whatever we're doing this? Left wing water. Left wing water. Fair Explain. Enough. It's just Kale. water in a big bottle, like covered with left leaning stickers. Like one Kale, of them says, you? "No war, but class war." My son's like, "But dad, that's still war." <laughs> it's not the same thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Kale, what are you having? Oh, I'm still drinking my watermelon. Wow, because uh, miraculously, it's lasted this long. And I'm drinking. Jack Daniels. That's get off this video right now. Should have just gotten a straw. Are we gonna do a Jack Daniels <laughs> tasting? Are we gonna do a Jack Daniels product tasting? This is actually Jack Daniels bottled in bond. Uh, I think it's too bad actually. Um, and you know, we might do a Jack Daniels tasting one of these days. Um, so the two big ones, so Jack Daniels does a, uh, a gold label, and they also do a uh, Frank Sinatra. Those are the two expensive ones. The gold label is $100 a bottle, and the Frank Sinatra is $200 a bottle. Um, I've tried the Frank Sinatra before. I didn't really think it was worth the money, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see someday. Um, so we got a few topics we're going to cover tonight, but uh, I'm just going to say a word, Kale, and I want you to, to elaborate if you would. Okay. Bananas. This shit is bananas. B A N A N A. Uh, I hope there's more to it than that. No, uh, I recently watched an informative video about the Chiquita Banana Company and the dark history of banana republics in the Central Americas and how uh, basically capitalism destroyed like six Central American countries uh, for like 50 years or something like that. Um, and not, and when I say destroyed countries, I don't just mean like, oh, it, it uh, destroyed the populace. It literally caused deforestation and uh, a lot of biological problems too for the wildlife that was normally in that area. And I was just shocked. And the, you hear the term banana republic and you think of really crappy genes, but really what it is, is uh, just the Western uh, big corporations getting involved in small countries that don't have the the position of power to negotiate right and so they get taken for everything they're worth and they're bled dry and then they move on well kale you said you were shocked which is a rather appropriate word to use because one of the better books to read about that is brandon shock doctor shock doctrine um which is uh deeply about economics in, in uh, Central and South America and, and it's Naomi Klein. Klein I knew it was Naomi, I could think of her last name for whatever reason, yeah, Naomi Klein, very very good book talks a lot about what's going on in, the, in Central and South America, especially I mean, you know, the banana stuff obviously is a big part of it, but also um, it kind of goes deeper than that um, in the American Fruit Company yeah um also, uh, along that same lines, it's not quite the same subject, but it involves South America a lot. Uh, the Confessions of an Economic Hit. Again. Another good one to pick up. I've never, I've never read that one, but I should sometime. And, you know, uh, I think we all have connections in Central and South America, and um, we all want those people to do well, and we don't want to, you know, appoint dictators over them, you know, any more than we already have. We literally did in Chile, yeah. Well, not just Chile. I mean, more than that. But, but yeah, Chile is sort of being one of the more, one of the more uh, ridiculously brutal examples of a dictator, which was CIA backed. How about um, Belarus? 
That's not in Central America. I don't believe that's in Central or South America, Kim. It's still a dictator. And he's calling yeah, a dictatorship, but uh, um, I feel like we could probably do more here with regard to, you know, just not destabilizing countries. Um, yeah. That's, and actually, the rum industry, like the rum industry is not great about it. The, the rum industry is not great about stuff like that, too. You know, the rum industry, uh, Florida Kanye, uh, you know, was responsible for a bunch of its workers getting diseases and things um, because they didn't have sufficient, uh, you know, uh, safety protocols. Um, How about so, the, I mean, it, it's not just bananas, but, but bananas definitely were a big part of it. Was uh, East India Trading Company kind of like that? Not in Central and South America. <laughs> it was more in uh, Brandon. Where was that? India. Yeah, that's right. The you colonize. know, I see why they named it that. It, oh, it, the it all of a sudden makes sense. Yeah, um, that's that's the British being pretty awful in their last moments of being an empire. So anyway, yeah, the British uh, could be very British sometimes. What's it? Um, the Bengal famine where essentially Churchill is responsible for like 6 million deaths. You know, it's sort of interesting. I feel like there's this, this thing we have where we all like to put certain people up on a pedestal and be like, you know, this person is sort of perfect, but I mean, Churchill was, you know, was great at certain things. Um, and I think was probably the person that great Britain needed during world war II. Um, but also, was terrible in many ways and, and not necessarily a great leader and did a lot of really bad things and um, like to drink significant, significant amounts of alcohol uh, on a daily basis. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he, he, he wasn't a good guy. And so we, we sort of put these people on a pedestal and forget that there is, you know, everybody has multiple facets of their personality. Nobody is all good or all bad. Um, everybody is a unique sort of, creature and you have to you have to look at them from all sides and, and some people are good um until you look at them from a certain perspective and other people are bad until you look at them from a certain perspective i mean there were certainly people in the united states that would have view, uh, viewed eugene debs as a as a villain uh many did um until you look at the the proper perspective yes but he didn't starve six million people to death well, sure. I mean, if, if that's your bar, I suppose. Um, yeah, it's, it, I think it's, it's one of those things. I think, I think it's, it's tough when you look at consumption and how do we do consumption? And, you know, there's sort of the old uh, saying, there's no such thing as ethical consumption in, in capitalism. And I think that's probably true um, that, you know, we shouldn't be, sort of micro attacking each other for every single different kind of soda we purchase. But on a personal level, it is a good idea to look at the things you purchase and try to find ways to purchase things in the most ethical way you can. I mean, you're, you're never going to be able to be, you know, only purchasing everything from small local co-ops and whatever. But if you can purchase some things from small local co-ops, that's better than nothing. So. Oh, sorry. 2.1 to 3 million. Fair enough. Um, so, yeah. source. so uh, one other thing you were going to talk about, Keon, I feel like this is, you know, this is something you're not going to get a lot of pushback in this group, but, but you talk about the idea of mental health days. Yeah. So what do you think about mental health days? Well, the reason I thought about it was because um, the idea of the fake cough, that was the spark. Um, right. when you have to call in to a play to stay your, to your place of work and be like, Oh, I can't make it today. Uh, I'm sick, whatever. And you're faking being sick. So you don't have to go to work when you should just be able to be like, I can't make it in today. I got other shit I got to deal with, yeah. but yeah. then you're under the threat of, uh, poverty and homelessness in, in, and hunger because now the there is a point where they could be like oh well you can't do that or else you'll be fired and it's a really really fucked up system but uh a, a part of that to me is the idea of mental health days like you get vacation days you get sick days 
um, from some places, not all. Uh, you should get sick days from all places, but you don't. Yes. But mental health days should be included as well. Uh, and I think like right now is a very poignant time in, in our history, in, in our being to bring this point up because, you know, we talk about workers' rights and forming unions to get, uh, you know, better, better privileges at work. Um, or not privileges, but but just rights. more rights, more more uh, negotiating power, basically. And part of that is realizing that we're all human beings, and that we weren't meant to operate like machines and just do a thing for so many hours a week, and just be like, okay, go home and rest. Now come back and do this thing, and don't don't ever let any of your social activities or your personal life ever interfere with you coming to work and doing your job. And it's, it should be more like, no, um, if you keep me, if you keep burning this candle at this pace, it's going to burn out. And you need to let this, this person, you know, they need a day just back off and give them a day. And that's all I got to say. Well, you it. said uh, the way you put it was, I just, I have things going on today. What if somebody is, you know, you know, has PTSD or something like that. And they're like, yeah, today I can't get out of bed because I'm, you know, paralyzed with anxiety. I mean, how do you tell your employer that? I mean, that's the one thing, you know, if, if when you work for an employer where they don't, where, where it's not a premium, where, where your, your sick days aren't at a premium uh, and you just call in and you just say, I'm using a sick, I'm using sick leave today. That's it. In other words, you don't say why, you don't say what's going on. You say, I have sick leave. I'm using sick leave today. Because you're nobody not questions it and nobody asks about it. But in capitalism, in the private sector, you just can't do that because everybody's always going to push, be pushing you. No, well, you have to fuck over your workers a little more. And again, I feel like we are sort of rehashing a little bit into what we were talking about in the anti-work episode, but it's fine. It's, it's still very important. But I want to focus more specifically on the mental health days. Um, you've been seeing it probably more and more, uh, TV commercials, uh, internet advertising, uh, things like that, social media, where, you know, people are aware that there are people that are having problems with stress and, and things like that, anxiety. And this was just something before I feel like, uh, and, and some people might even be uh, neurodivergent. And that's another thing into that, that uh, like I was about to say, it seems like it's mostly um, either ignored or just, uh, just they think, oh, you're weird or whatever. But, you know, instead of just acknowledging that you're a person an individual that has this other specific way of thinking about things. Well, I mean, if you take uh, it to the extreme, to... I mean, imagine somebody who has you suffering from schizophrenia or something like that. Um, I mean, can you imagine what it'd be like for them to call into a job and be like, um, yeah, reality's not really working out for me today. And I'm having a hard time telling reality from, from delusion or, or, or something like that. Um, and that's, by the way, a health issue and should absolutely fall under, you know, uh, sick leave or, or, or paid time off for, for health conditions. But I mean, again, when you make people say, I mean, that's, that's the real, the real answer to all this, I think is you have uh, sick leave, sick time. Um, and nobody fucking questions it. You don't have to explain why you're taking sick leave. You should just say, have I have sick I, leave and I, I'm taking it today. I think explaining yourself is one of the most degrading and humiliating things in any situation. The idea that anybody has the authority to make you explain yourself bothers me. Um, well, I mean, I would... the, 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 the counter to that would be imagine if um, the company wanted me to work overtime and I was like, well, I'm going to need a valid excuse for you to be asking me to work overtime. And then imagine the company gave you their, their excuse and you're like, 
Yeah, I don't really think that's valid. I'm going to need you to give me a note from a, a from a, a business consultant that says that's really a valid reason for you to be asking for overtime. Um, and unless you provide that, I'm not going to work it. Give me your version of a cough. Right. Um, but <laughs> we don't. It's, it's funny. It's funny that something like that, that seems to be so incredibly necessary so normal and something that makes sense is something that you tell somebody and they're like oh that's ridiculous that somebody should just be able to use you know their their sick leave for when they don't feel well um, well and again if your business model can't handle somebody taking a sick day you don't have a viable business model yeah yeah um so kale i i have been told that you have been re-watching some of our videos yeah. So <laughs> and, and what? That's and where you're so, supposed to uh, say a thing. That was okay. I would, all I was gonna say was that I enjoy rewatching our videos, and I always uh, I always find like little parts where I'm thinking, oh well, I should have said this, or you know, oh I did I didn't quite catch that part. So, oh well, now this is what I think about that. Now that I know that and. It's just interesting to kind of rewatch, you know, because I'm not really uh, hyper focused on uh, what we're doing right here. I'm just talking, we're talking, I'm listening to you guys, but then I actually get a chance to watch the video and sit there and in my own silence and just pay attention to the video and watch how it goes down. And I'm like, oh, I should have said that there. Or I should have, you know, I should have asked that. Have you had one of those aha moments where you're like, oh, now I see it a different way or whatever? Um, not like a big aha, but probably a couple of little ahas. To be honest, I don't rewatch much, but I also do the editing. So I watch every video at least, you know, all the way through at least once, sometimes more. Um, and I definitely have parts where I either um, hate a joke that I said or I'm angry at myself for not making a joke that I think of when I'm watching the edit. Um, and uh, I've thought sometimes about putting that in, but I think people, I don't know if people like little, you know, input, you know, uh, inserted little things about me being a snarky asshole. Um, they probably get enough of me being a snarky asshole during the episode. So um, yeah, I did. I rewatch, I, I rewatch them for the edit, but that's about it. Unfortunately. I personally uh, do refrain from making little snide jokes that normally oh, you would. in IRL I would totally do that <laughs> um, I know Kale we've met we, we've been we've been introduced um, I don't know Brian what, what episodes have you watched like what, what have you gotten from episodes you've rewatched um, let's see I think I rewatched the um the American Horror Story one at least once just because somebody commented on it and I went back and just watched it over again. And um, I got to say, our voices sound pretty good in my car. So there's been a couple of times where I've just went back and played it. I will probably watch the anti-work one again. I think I've watched the... Uh... Damn it. I probably made a whole bunch of noise right there with my fingers. Um you did. That's uh, right. Living wage one. I think I rewatched that one too. Um, I I I think they're pretty good. There's it's funny you bring I that up because for, like for me, I despise my voice. Like it has taken me so long uh, on editing videos and things like this to be able to even get to a point where I can stand to listen to anything with my voice in it uh, because it is so just like nails on a chalkboard, which is, I guess, kind of a depressing thought, but um, yeah, it, it's taken me a long time to be able to edit videos, get through all this stuff without like, while listening to my voice and not hating it. So, well, and they say it I mean, sounds different in your head. It sounds different to you than it does to the people listening to it. Oh yeah. My video, my voice sounds totally different. Like when I, when I listen to it on video, I'm like, why would anybody listen to this guy? <laughs> I hate it, but I think it's, it's one of those things. And I, I was listening to a lot of editing videos when I sort of, we started doing a lot of this stuff. Um, and they basically said, yeah, you just listen to it enough. And I'm to the point now 
where I've listened to my voice for, you know, I don't know, a hundred hours or whatever, however much video we've got, you know, posted on here. Um, and I, I, I can, I've gotten to the point where I can take my own voice and not be bothered by it, which is, was, was a big step for me. Like when we were younger and we used to, rec- we, we'd have like tapes where we recorded various little things here and there. Um, maybe that'll be a special bonus thing. People can listen to us play a song. <laughs> Cause I have it. I have it. Um, and uh, I remember like listening to my voice and, and like, I didn't sing cause thank Christ for that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'd hear myself talking on the tapes and just be like, Jesus. Um, we, maybe we'll make a, maybe we'll make a video of old, old songs at some point, And that will be, you know, embarrassing for everybody. Well, and Kayla, we your, your of- audio has improved since our early ones too which has been kind of nice to track that progress. I improved my setup um, because when we first started, I was just using my phone. I just had it set up. On it was stand. just in a lake. He was just, he was just standing in a lake. <laughs> now I'm in a Very lake far of fire. And now he's moved to a hut. He's in a, he's in a hut somewhere. So it's big improvement. I have a screen camera and a microphone and a magic box that does things <laughs> yeah um you also wanted to provide uh some netflix recommendations you've seen some things on netflix uh my netflix recommendation right now is watch community again because that's what i'm doing and white tiger yeah oh white tiger man and so uh for we actually did one of the first episodes we recorded was a review of the movie white tiger, which we all really loved. Um, and I don't know if I'll release it at some point. It's kind of not exactly timely at this point, but yeah, that was a great movie. I'm just, I'm still kind of torn about because the way it ended doesn't really align with my moral compass, but I get why he did what he did. Yeah. Anyway. So what other stuff would you recommend? Um, um, so I'm kind of a Netflix junkie. Uh, I don't have all the other services. Um, I don't do anything with Amazon because Bezos. And I don't have HBO Max or hulu or anything i just have the netflix so that's that's my jam so um i got a handful here of what we're currently starting season five of the peaky blinders it's not bad Okay, so Peaky Blinders. I tried to watch the first episode of Peaky Blinders. Yeah. And I couldn't make it through the first episode of Peaky Blinders. Um, Please give me a reason to finish the first episode of Peaky Blinders. Largely, it's uh, the cast. Um, It's nothing you haven't seen before. You, if you've ever watched like any kind of gangster show, you know basically what's going to happen. But largely, it's the cast. It's very well cast, and the acting is pretty good. All right, Kiel. What is your uh, Netflix recommendation list? You're muted. Yeah, there you go. One, two, three, go. Okay, so uh, yeah. Um... Just a couple here. Uh, there's one called Lead Me Home, which is a documentary about homelessness in the U.S. And I think we, the three of us at least, have some feelings and thoughts about the homelessness situation here. Um, there's another one that's called Passing. It's about a... Uh, light-skinned African-American woman uh, back in the, I'm not sure, 40s maybe, something like that. Um, uh, This basically 
passing herself off as a Caucasian and like all the drama that happens behind the scenes in that with her friends and family and whatnot. Um, there's one called Love and Fury, which is also kind of, it's kind of a documentary, but um, not really a documentary, I'm not, I'm, I guess. Uh, but it's about um, Native American artists and just the their kind of nomadic travel ac across the country and sharing their art with people. And then there's another one that's called The Last Forest, which is about a tribe, um, which is not untouched, but still fairly private and trying to maintain their individual uh, tribe and stay who they are and keep doing what they do while Western civilization and whatnot are trying to encroach on their land. But those are the four that really kind of I thought I should say something about. You just recently watched them? Yes. Um, as far as Netflix goes, oh, I, you know, one we should have brought up for the last episode is, uh, uh, I think it's a movie. Maybe it's a series called Made. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. it's a series. Vanessa watched that one recently. She liked it a lot. It's really good. I mean, if you have uh, any doubts about the struggle of a woman leaving an abusive relationship, <clears throat> trying to get any help from the system trying to find an employer that doesn't just at every opportunity take advantage of her. It's, it's very much, I think, an anti-work show. Okay. One of the things that I watch uh, streaming services a lot for is uh, horror stuff. Um, and Netflix is Netflix can be really good and sometimes fall a little short in that on that regard. Um, so we watched Gerald's Game. I'd seen it before. Uh, Gerald's Game on Netflix, which is a really really good one. It's uh, Carl Gugino and uh, oh god, what's the lead actor's name? Green. Uh, it's been like a million things, and of course now I won't be able to think of his first name. Uh, that that's an adaptation of the Stephen King book, uh, and I think it's a really good adaptation. So I would watch that. But honestly, a few of the other ones that I've seen recently on uh, Netflix, as far as the the horror stuff, hasn't been great. Uh, Blood Red Sky, I didn't like. Uh, what was it Night Teeth? I didn't particularly care for that one. Um, I thought it was kind of, I don't know, just kind of ho hum. Um, Netflix is such a weird thing when it comes to their their uh, original programming, um, where every so often they'll come out with some really, really good stuff. Uh, and then you'll have five movies in a row that are just kind of really generic. And I don't know, Netflix can be frustrating. The most important one that I think people would probably be the most curious about for somebody who's a horror fan uh, is Midnight Mass, um, which is uh, Mike Flanagan, who also did uh, um, the house on uh, the haunting of Hill house and the haunting of Bly Manor. Um, and I watched that one recently and sort of like those first two, um, I liked about 85% of it and I hated the ending. Um, so kind of take that for us. Uh, did you guys watch uh, Bly Manor or Hill house or midnight mass? No horror, not being really my thing. It's fine. It's a, uh, I don't know. I just, I felt like they were not, they were not what I think they could have been, I guess. And I apologize for continuing to look over. I'm looking at my view history so I can tell you what I did, what I've been looking at. Um, there was the fear street trilogy that came out on Netflix recently. I thought that was pretty underwhelming. Um, I guess I'm going to be kind of negative. I, I apologize for being negative on Netflix. Uh, I actually like Netflix a lot. I've just talked about the horror that I've seen recently on there. Um, and a lot of it's not really, been that great i guess i will say I this for netflix they have a lot more um international stuff yes like, yes that's very true a lot of things that weren't made here in america 
And I think that opens up some channels. Well, you really see just how much there is that isn't made here in America and some really good stuff. Oh, uh, actually, uh, Pieces of a Woman was on Netflix. Pieces of a Woman is very, very good. That was nominated for an Oscar. Um, Mank. Uh, Mank was nominated for an Oscar, too. I didn't think it was maybe that level, but it was definitely a fun movie. And Cam, uh, which is a very strange movie um, about a, a cam girl um, who gets duplicated. It's kind of watch the movie to, to see what happens there, but it's 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 real a real interesting little movie. And It Comes at Night is another one. It Comes at Night is a, is a tough movie for um, as to whether people like it or not, because it's especially the ending of the movie. I think some people could call it kind of unsatisfying, um, but it's also once you get through it, I think I watched it twice. Uh, and the second time I watched it, I felt like I got it a lot more and liked it more. I almost watched it. Um, it is, it comes at night. It's, it is not what you think it's going to be. I'll, I'll tell you that much, very much. Uh, uh, it's, it's not what you think it's going to be. And it's, it's good. Um, but you kind of have to, um, you have to get in the right headspace for it. Uh, and okay. then my most controversial one, which people will hate me for, I watched the five bloods and I hated it. I thought it was terrible, which a lot of people were talking about Delroy Lindo for, uh, getting an Oscar for that movie. I love Delroy Lindo. I think he's a great actor and I didn't like him in that movie and I didn't like anything about that movie. Please address all your hate mail to Mike Kelly. Please do. Yeah. I'm more than welcome. More than welcome. Uh, it's not What's my the, fault. It was a bad movie. Aside from, like you've talked about before, comfort shows, book, movie, whatever. What's the thing you have redone the most? Rewatched, reread, whatever. Well, like I said, as far as shows, I've rewatched Community and Scrubs like a million times. Well, Scrubs a million times, uh, Community half a million times. Um, I don't rewatch movies or reread books really almost at all. Um, I don't care. What do you think? Is there a movie you rewatch multiple times? Aside from Deuce Bigelow, obviously. Will you lay off the Deuce Bigelow thing? <laughs> like I said, I watched it once and I've never heard the end of it. No, I don't know. I mean, I watch a lot of movies of a bunch of times i guess um do like, you get do you catch new stuff every time well not on all of them i mean sometimes i just rewatch it because i love it um well i mean all the times i rewatch it is because i love it but i'm not always doing it just you know to try to get more out of it sometimes it's just like okay i want to do this again because it was good the first time so it might as well be good the second time and i don't know like obviously i watched the crow a bunch of times um i watched endgame oh a bunch of kale did you see they just released test footage of jason momoa as the crow i saw a still pick uh, artist rendering of Jason Momoa as the crow. And the first thing in my head was that's enough Jason Momoa. I don't know. I, mean, I thought I he looked like really it. good. I think he's, he would probably be really just fun just to hang out with, honestly. But um, like, I'm just, no, nah, no, nah. it's like, it's kind of like they did with the rock. It's like, let's just put him in everything. And no, just stop it. Stop putting him in everything. I don't know. I'm looking at the pictures right now and uh, Google him. You guys, you know, you're the audience. You decide. I think he looks pretty. He would look, he would have looked pretty good as the crow. Well, my, my first thought, I didn't even know that was a thing. My first thought is they don't need to remake the crow. It was fine. Um, and well, I think this would have been like a, a sequel or something because they like it was like a reimagining. By the way, it's been canceled, so that that is oh, okay. not coming out. Um, but like, there's there's images online of him with the makeup on, and like, I think he looks like he's got the right bone structure for it. I guess I don't know what it is, but yeah, I picture like well, uh, I picture Brandon Lee. I pi I picture a smaller man. To me, he's almost too muscular and fit for the the role he's supposed to look more uh 
dreamlike, wraith like, I think. I mean, Timote Shell and me would probably be good at it. By the way, as far as Netflix recommendations, I totally forgot. Uh, one of the best horror movies that I've seen in recent history is His House, uh, which is on Netflix and is great movie. Really great movie. Um, one of the things that I always think is you can make a, just, a movie that's sort of about social justice. Um, and I, I like that, but you have to make it a good movie first. And His House is a perfect example of them making a movie that is a great movie, a great horror movie first, and then also a great movie about social justice afterwards. Um, you can disagree with what they're saying and still agree that that is a great horror movie. I've also rewatched uh, the movie Unstoppable, which has got Chris Pine, Denzel Washington, and Rosario Dawson in it. And it's just a stupid movie about a train. But I keep watching it. I've probably watched it like 10 times. It's you don't need permission movie. to watch movies you like. I mean, that's like... I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. Like, like uh, it's like your safety thing. Um, like I said, for me, I want, I, I have lots of safety things. I just, it's not movies for me. It's always TV shows. Well, you've probably seen the big Lebowski a million times too. I I've seen the big Lebowski a bunch. I haven't watched it recently. I probably haven't watched it in the last five years. I would say for me, probably the number one most rewatched movie is probably uh, high fidelity. I've watched it that one over be. and over. It used to be uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, though, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that yeah, movie? And like perfect. when we both seen Army of Darkness like a million times. Yeah. But um, High Fidelity, I read the book. I watched the television show. I, w- I would rewatch the television show again. But... Well, it's so I was watching uh, one, I'm, uh, one of the YouTube channels that I watch a lot is uh, uh, Horror Timelines. Um, and he put out a, a video on uh, questions about child's play. And uh, I, I've met the, the the guy, you know, we talked out in LA a few times and, and uh, um, one of the things it shows is Brad Deeroff standing over the doll doing the whole, ah, do a damn And uh, I was watching this video and it made me think, I want to see Ash trying to transfer his soul so he can be like, ah, they do a. <laughs> I thought that would be great. You have to be a child's play fan for that to make sense, apparently. Yeah, I have a I have a picture, a meme or whatever on my phone. It's like you know the beginning of the Simpsons when they always have Bart writing something on the board. Well instead they got Ash there and he's writing Veratu and Nectu and then he's like Vatu Verata Nectu. Yeah. There's um uh, uh I was watching rewatching Deadwood with commentary on. And there's one part where Brad Deeroff is yelling at uh, Swearingen. And I think it's Robin Wiegert and somebody else is watching and doing the commentary. And she's like, oh, there he is. There's the Chucky voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing about that's weird about that is that uh, um, uh, Chris Sarandon plays the, the, uh, um, the cop in the first Child's Play movie and then just never comes back. And so it's sort of crazy that in all that time, they never were able to get Chris Aranda to come back and do like a little cameo somewhere. Did he go under the law and order? Well, I mean, I think what a lot of people know him the most from is Princess Bride. Hmm. Um, and actually, I we saw him down. Well, I don't know if we, you might not be down there. I was down at the bar at, uh, in Kansas City when he was at uh, Planet Comic Con. Was he at- was that- and I didn't ask him for a picture in line like I did George Takei and then immediately felt like an idiot. Was George Takei like, oh my. <laughs> no, if he had, that would have made it worth it. <laughs> well, when we saw him getting breakfast, we let him just have breakfast. <laughs> uh, no, I talked to him. I talked to him in the line. Um, and uh, he was like, I kind of got my hands full. And I was like, you're correct. You do. I'm going to stop bothering you. That, you know, celebrities are people too. And sometimes they just don't like being fucked with. Like, okay, I got my picture with Stan Lee. And Stan Lee looks like he's falling asleep. And I got my picture Probably because with John he was. Cusack. Because John Cusack's fucking awesome. But he looks like he just like, he's like, let's just get this over with. 
I'll tell you, to be honest, I have a hard time and I, and I've had my picture taken with people that I paid for pictures for not a lot, but a few. Um, and I don't think I would do it again. Now it just, it's so weird to pay to take a picture with somebody. Um, yeah. Um, now one of the things, so I, I've talked about this a couple of times, um, uh, and I don't know how you guys feel on this. So there is a, a star uh, with whom I have an interesting relationship. Um, don't worry, we're not having sex or anything. Um, and that is uh, one Mr. Superman himself, Dean Cain. Um, Dean Cain, if you know anything about our politics, Dean Cain is on quite the other side uh, of the political spectrum from us. Um, and But he's somebody that I've I've never been able to sort of get a, a serious hate on for like i don't i don't agree with him i think he's wrong about everything um and the reason is is very simple that uh you know dean kane came to iraq when i was in iraq i had a picture taken with him he, he was there with uh miss universe it was very exciting you know because there's nothing else going on you're in iraq um and every time i've seen dean kane after that at various conventions and things i've told i you know reminded him about it and uh, the last time i saw him i didn't even have to remind him. he recognized me um and he was incredibly polite incredibly nice you know treat, treated me very very well um and it's one of those things i think i you have to i think admit to human frailties of like yeah i don't hate dean kane it has nothing to do with his politics his politics are reprehensible i disagree with him on everything um but the guy's always been unbelievably nice to me personally and i can't ignore that yeah. um and it's it's a weird feeling of like, like when people say bad things about Dean Kane, I'm like, you're right. And I'm not going to defend him. I, I'm not going to go online and, you know, say you're wrong. No, you're right. He does have bad views. But like, I also I can't feel that. Like, I can't feel a sense of hatred for the person because he's always been incredibly nice to me. Um, and it's, it's a strange feeling. I don't know that I've ever met anybody famous. I've been in the same room with a couple of famous people. I don't think I've ever been. Well, we've met Ron Paul. I met Ron Paul several times. Yeah. yeah. Um, who was? Well, uh, yeah, who living was here in Iowa, I've met quite a few of the presidents and presidential candidates. Go ahead, Gail. No, I was going to ask Brandon. Uh, who was the guy that played Gopher on the Love Boat? Oh yeah. I remember Boy, I Tony. I don't know if I can think of his name. Yeah, Tony shot him in the eye with a pee. <laughs> yeah, he was there just was... cleaning off his table and he flicked him in the eye with it. Gopher. Yeah, and his comment was, "Oh, I think we're in the line of fire here." Morsels are not missiles. Apparently, they are in Madrid. <laughs> So I've got to be honest, I've only, I, I've seen like probably five episodes of The Love Boat. Okay, we had these lunch cards. And okay, this is like late 80s, early No, no, 90s. that's not what I mean. I mean, like, who is Gopher? Did you not Gopher, just put in uh, Gopher in The Love Boat? Major D, the Major D. Oh, yeah, I probably could have done that, couldn't I have done? I just went to uh, uh, IMDb, sorry. He was a senator or a congressman or something. Yeah, congressman i think yeah at the time it, oh, i mean fred grandy yeah fair enough at the time i think it was still harkin and you know the fucking guy that never dies grassley yeah and harkin i think it was who, still harkin because he's on, actually he's actually almost exactly the same age he's born is in 48 a primary example of fucking the the power class over the worker class that Harkin and Grassley are on both opposite sides of the sides of the aisle, and yet they've come together on at least three major fucking deals where they both profited from it. Just saying. By Just the way, saying. Fred Grandy was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Iowa uh, from 1987 until 19, 1995. Excuse me, uh, in the sixth and fifth districts. Well, anyway. And somebody in Madrid threw a pee at him. Tony used his lunch card. We had lunch cards that he'd scan at the end of the line. And they were flicky. 
And so we were going to lunch second, so there was leftover food on the table. And another time, Curtis was wearing snowflage, you know, the white camouflage in front of the red brick wall. And Randy Dalton goes, where's Kurt? I can't see Kurt. I should remind our younger listeners that at one point, that was actually a fresh thing to say (laughs) and a new thing to say and considered by many to be very, very humorous. (laughs) That time is not now. Only in 1992, since then, it's been dead. (laughs) Unfortunately, since 1992, uh, almost the years have passed. Let's call it, let's let's say about 10 years since then. About 10 years have passed since then. So is, is, going back a step, is Grassley now the longest serving senator? Yes. I mean, how could he not be? He's running for his seat and, again, for God's sake. Yeah. Re- and, I thought he was and, and Branstead is the holder of the longest serving governor in the country. Why do we keep doing this to ourselves? I because know. Iowans like everything to just kind of stay the same. Um, okay, we can so run people we want change, but we're not comfortable with it. Grassley's what, 81 when he first went in? Not old he went in in 1981 uh, let's see here as far as a uh yes 1981 january 3rd 1981 so that means he became a senator when i was two no 40 years he ago? became a senator when i was one and a half central america or central america i what is central america this um so uh, Chuck Grassley is running for is is running again. Um, so if he wins in November, that means when he assumes office uh, in January of 2023, that he'll still be a rich old white guy. He will be uh, 90 or 89. No, he'll be 90 if he wins if he wins next November for any that's a six year term. So imagine winning a six year term when you're 90. I mean, that seems awfully optimistic to me. I don't know. 96 was a good year for me. Well, you guys, uh, I'll tell you what, for you non-Iowa people, look up Chuck Grassley. He's a trip like he's a he, genuinely interesting um, also look up Steve character. King. Uh, if you know, awful. Hey, you There's been to... times, you know, you were talking about Dean Cain and that. There's been times where he has done something that my sister didn't like, and she's, I don't know if you'd call her like super right wing, but she's certainly right of all of us. But there's been a couple of times where he did something she didn't like, but she just completely forgets about it eventually. Well, that sounds weird. She she forgives him for it. Because he was really helpful in getting Arturo into the country and helping fast track getting him in. It's weird how sometimes politicians will just help the little guy every once in a while and they'll make a convert out of like one or two people that will just, well, no matter what happens, they'll never. I'll tell you what, Vanessa, you know, she works a lot, you know, in the Latin American community. And there is at least one person I know. Um, that she's worked with that said that he will always vote for Republicans because of Ronald Reagan doing amnesty. They're like that one thing that basically they won his vote forever. That's a little close minded, but well, it's not, but, but the thing is, it's not, it's not crazy. It's not, you can understand that it makes like, sense. I mean, it, it's not, I don't think it's right, but it makes sense. Brandon brings up an interesting subject here that that I want to talk about. Uh, Personal relationships. Uh, You talked about your sister being very uh, more right than, and you're obviously far, far left. Um, When it comes to personal relationships, and I don't know if we've ever talked about this, to be honest, and this might be like opening up a whole nother can of worms, but um i've had conversations where you know my friends and family members are like oh it's all it's all politics to you it's all it's always about this or that or can't we just talk about something else 
How, I mean, do you have, how do you deal with the uncomfortableness in your personal relationships because of your ethics? Well, I think one of the weird things is, so when I first met Andrea, um, all I knew about her was that she was a pastor who lived an hour and a half away. And my first thought was, because all I knew was pastors being right wing and evangelical. And so I was hesitant at first. And then I came to find out that not all pastors are right wing and evangelical. So for me, it, it became pretty obvious that she was also left again, probably not as left as I am, but most people aren't. But um, and there's still moments, though, where like my dad, who is right wing. Will ask me something about what Andrea thinks about it, and when I tell him that she mostly agrees with me, he gets kind of this surprised look like. And I want to say you know, I wouldn't be in a long-term with a relationship with someone I just so fundamentally disagree with. Now, my dad and I have managed to work it out. We've had harsh words here and there, but we have managed to uh, try and keep it on an even keel. Um, one of my cousins on Facebook, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that he wouldn't accidentally hit me with his car if he could um i don't that's know that's good to <laughs> well and there's no thing that says well they're a family you have to stick by them eh, eh, i don't really have to i mean if you're pro you know bad things then we don't have to get along and we don't have to keep talking you know well, uh, Dan Savage is always quoting somebody and I, I'm always careful about this because Dan Savage didn't say the quote. Uh, he's quoting somebody else. So Dan, if you're watching, I'm not quoting you. I'm quoting you quoting somebody else. I just don't know who the original quote came from. Um, and it is basically you have your biological family and you have your logical family. Um, and, you know, who do you want to spend more time with? Yeah. Now, sometimes they coincide. You know, there are some times where your biological family is logical. Um, and that's great. And sometimes your biological family, you know, you do have to spend time with them. I mean, you shouldn't just throw them away. Um, but they, they are definitely, they're different. Do you have, I mean, in my family, same for my wife, of course. Uh, and, you know, probably my son. But in my family, my extended family, I don't think I have a single cohort i don't think i have a single leftist in my family any of the young ones any of the old ones there's some that are more ambivalent and there's some that agree with some of the things i have to say but i don't think i have i think they're all at least center to center right to far right i think well before... i'm i'm sort of weird and kale i want to answer this for you because i think i think your answer is going to be more interesting than mine um because you have a much bigger family. Like for me, my family is mostly extended and I mostly don't talk to most of them. Um, it's one of those things where I sort of made the decision a long time ago um, that I'm just not going to put up with people that are um, being sort of abusive online or any of that type of thing. Like if you do that, I'm just going to cut you off. I, I don't have any, I don't have any innate need. Um, to talk to biological family members. It's just not something that I, I am focused on. Um, but I have an aunt. It's, it's pretty progressive. And um, my mom is weird because she is very conservative, but also uh, she's super religious and very, very empathetic. Um, I mean, you know, you look at sort of the Trump situation. If, I mean, if my mom ever thought she offended somebody like that, she'd be mortified to think that she ever offended somebody. Um and so she's conservative, but she isn't conservative in the sort of she's conservative in so, sort of the more traditional sense, I think, and, and not so much in the new sense. Sure. Um, but other than that, most of the most of the extended family members are, are generally pretty conservative, I think. But, Kale, you've got a bigger family. I think your answer to this is probably going to be more interesting than mine. Um, well, I, I got both of your responses there i understand where you're coming from um and they both made me think of a couple of things um uh, one 
as someone who is desperately trying to practice stoicism and probably not very well, but I'm trying, um, I always try to choose compassion and understanding. And, uh, I just try to choose love. Um, but like you said, sometimes there's just some asshole that just gotta, that's just gotta get under your skin. Like they're digging and you know, they're digging and they know they're digging. Um, and so it's just at that point, it becomes a choice. How do you react to that? Do you not respond or do you lash out? And in my particular case, I did have a, a family member. I made a comment about a particular topic and they said something that was, I feel out of, I don't want to say like it was out of line because like it wasn't out of line. I mean, you have a right to say what you want to say, but it was just like, you purposely said that thing to be facetious. You were going out of your way to try to hurt me. It's like that, the, 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 the fight uh, game debate thing. And that was clearly just a fight. That was just trying to hurt me instead of making a valid argument about why I was wrong, because there was no valid argument about why I was wrong. It was just like, fuck you. Yeah. And so I stopped talking to that person. And that person is my blood relative. And we just, we don't talk. I have no idea what that person is doing now. And yeah, I don't really I care. understand that. I could but, understand coming to that, to that end pass and just saying, no, I'm not doing this anymore. Mental health. I'm, I'm not subjecting myself to this anymore. I will well, say. and I think I think that's important. I think you know we, we're sort of chit chatting episode. We're not getting too deep on a lot of this stuff, but it, it is important that if you have somebody, you you can't allow yourself to be abused. Um, if somebody is treating you in a way, that, don't get me wrong. By the way, you can have spirited debate, um, and again, I don't like debate, but I understand if you like debate uh, or, or spirited discussion. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if somebody is to the point where you can tell. Uh, they are literally just doing things to try and make you feel bad or to, to hurt your feelings or to, to you know, uh, alienate you or whatever they're doing, then that person is now, no, they, they have already decided they're not your family member because they have put uh, their own political ideology above any sort of familial bond they feel to you. Um, and the point is you just have to cut that person out as best you can. And again, it's one of those things that's tough because, you know, I think we're all grown up and we live in our own houses and our own everything. And so it's in some cases, I think for, for my case, much more easy. Uh, and for Kale say in Kale's situation, less easy. Cause I mean, you're related to 90% of the town. Um, but uh, you know, you can, you can cut people off. You can just say, I'm walking away. Because nothing further is going to be gained from this interaction. And I feel you're like, you're only engaging in this to be hurtful um, and just walk away. I mean, and again, I know there are certain people that are in situations where they can't do that. Uh, and that's very unfortunate. Um, but well, and if you are in a situation where you can walk away. Uh, you always have the, the, the option to just walk away. Yeah. <clears throat> Along those same lines, there is times where, you know, People, especially with uh, um, gay, queer, bisexual, transgender people, you'll get people making fun of me like, oh, you know, sissy or whatever. And honestly, those are some of the bravest people, braver than I have ever been. People who are the way they are. And even in a small town filled with people that are they know are going to hate them and reject them and all that. They still live their lives. They still come out as who they are. And it's not, and not to shame anybody that has stayed in the closet. The reasons you do the things you do are up to you and completely valid. There's no reason you have to come out if you don't think you're in a safe situation. But those people that do have some of the most steely nerves and bravery I've ever seen. And anybody who thinks just because they're thin or skinny or whatever, but the, or, you know, or 
effeminate if they're a guy or something. Anybody that thinks that way isn't thinking of just how tough they are. I mean, the people that are constantly like, Trump, 2020, I'm in a huge truck. Those are the really scared people. They won't think outside of any preconceived box built by their friends and neighbors. They, they won't go out of that way at all. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's strange. Those are the people that I almost feel the most sorry for, the people that are, it's like, those are the people that are caught in the system. It's like, I have to have, you know, this many guns. I have to have a truck that sits at least this far up off the ground. I have to have 17 flannels, 25 car hearts, um, and 171 trucker caps. Um, you know, and it's just like, it's like you, you are, you are allowing uh, the establishment to control your entire life is that capitalism it's like, what like what what about what if you just decided one day to collect stamps i need more like you were just like you were like you know what i i love tiny pictures of deer that have 15 yeah. cents on them and that's just what i want to do it's like jesus at least you you did something different you did something that was not expected of you um and uh, so real quick. So one last thing is we're, we've been going on a little long with this, but uh, did everybody see the new kid rock video? I did not. Oh my I God. Brandon, you have to see it. Kid rock video. I did not watch the new kid rock video. Oh my God. It is the saddest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, it, it's so funny because like the refrains are like, you can't tell me what to do. Motherfucker. I'm so, and it's just like, but you're literally doing exactly what the establishment wants you to do. Like you, yeah. you are, you Look are at living, how free I am. living reverse psychology. Look at how free I am right now. Wait a minute. Wait and a minute. isn't he like middle aged rock now? <laughs> well, also he didn't grow up in Detroit, and he actually grew up on like a golf a, a mansion with a golf course too. Um, really, it's just how everything in this country is just bullshit. We it's it's all. It's all, uh, uh, you know, mythology. Um, but it's like you're living in this tiny little prism of what is considered to be acceptable for you as a person. Like as a man, it's like, okay, got to have the yeah, car, got to have the man, truck, got to have the hat, got to have the this, yeah. that, the other thing. Uh, I got to have a sports team. Like I listen to people talk about sports. And if you genuinely like sports, like if that is a genuine thing you're into, I get it, I guess. I don't really get it, but it's fine if you like it. Um but oh, the last fucking thing in the world I want to talk about is when guys are talking about when so and so threw a pass that didn't go far enough, and I'm like, I mean, I don't even know them. Right. I mean, I feel right. bad. I wish they threw the pass farther. <laughs> that would have been great for them, but they I don't had really. Four yards sports. on that pass, everything would have changed. And like, if you God. love playing sports, it's, again, it's no, no, no slight on anybody that likes to play sports, but like guys that are just genuinely or not even genuine, they're not being genuine. I don't think anyway, but that are, that are just sort of intensely discussing like who this team should draft in this round of the playoffs. And I'm like, man, you don't know any of those people. I like, none of this is going to affect your life at all. Like it's not going to affect your life at all. And competition. That's what that's about. People like drama and competition. I think I think there's a, a problem with being too reductionist, though. I, I think when you try and simplify what people are or what they think, I I, I think you're necessarily going to miss something. There's well, more no, I to think it. it's true because, like, if you watch football, like I watch, there's, we all watch football for a long time. And there is genuinely interesting things about the game. It's like, you know, how do you react to this defense? Like, it, it's interesting. Um, at least hypothetically, I don't watch it much anymore, but I get it. I understand why somebody would be interested in football, but it's a yeah. matter of how you turn that from that's an interesting thing to watch to if you're on the wrong team, then fuck you. And it's yeah. like, why does it have to be fuck you? Like, who cares? You know, they play the game and, you know, because you like the San Francisco 49ers, you fucking piece. Well, and then they'll say things like, right, Did exactly. You see when we. <laughs> When we did this, and I'm like, you didn't do anything. You were sitting on the couch. Right. You were eating chips. They were good chips, though. <laughs> it's like a bunch of people you don't know. <laughs> Who are too rich to hang out with you. Right. Who are being ruled over by owners who are even richer than them. I mean, I like Lionel Messi, but I think that guy gets paid like 
$1.2 million a game, something like that. I mean, I, we're out of the same league. I porn when I hear people bitch about how much athletes get paid. Because, like, on the one hand, I'm like, yeah, they shouldn't probably get paid that much. But on the other hand, it's like, good for you, worker, using your skills to get more money. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind. Fair. Also, the fucking owners make more than all of them. So, yeah. All right. It's definitely my bedtime. Yeah, I think we're going to go ahead and call it a night. Um, I believe this is going to be the last episode you see before the holiday season. So if you are celebrating a holiday or if you're not celebrating a holiday. um, I I got one more thing. Uh Uh-oh. All right, Kale, what's your one more thing? Oh, yeah. I got one more thing. This is going to be my new segment. I'm going to call it one more thing. Every time you're trying to shut down the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I can guarantee you Kale is not going to get a segment. And even if he did, it would not be called his one more thing. It's going to be called one more thing. Public servant slash public servants service. Um, I ju- It was a note that I feel like I know maybe this could be safe for another show, but I'm throwing it in here anyway. A little garnish, if you will. Uh, Thank goodness. Uh, people vote for other people to go say, hey, this is what those people over there wanted. But then somebody else comes along and is like, hey, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of money. And then uh, you, you say that they said they want this. And they forgot that they were public servants, not corporate servants. And they didn't forget that, Kale. That's the whole reason they ran for office in the first place. The Most people that run for office never took that seriously. Anyway. I feel like. You know, people who... Well, some of them did. Some of them did. Oh, I, I don't think the system's broken. We just we just need better people in it. Well, then fine. Well, this is one way you could at least try to do that, is to get people there that remember that I'm here for those people. Well, I, I think I think there's there's truth in what you're saying and the idea that it, it would be nice to get more people involved in the process. But I think that unfortunately, the way it is right now, there's a whole bunch of people that just don't want anything <coughs> to do with it. I mean, honestly, think about what it takes to run for office and how much of a pain it is, how much money you have to raise, um, how even if you do everything oh, right. Yeah. You can be, you know, tarred and feathered for something that you probably weren't even involved in. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare to be involved in public office. I mean, the only reward is the fact that you can leave public office and then go be a public and go, you know, work for a, a law firm or a, 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 a lobbyist firm. I asked because I was recently approached by a certain Democratic committee in a certain state to run for a public office in a certain town. And was a lot in Oklahoma. Yes. And I chewed on it and chewed on it and chewed on it. Then at the very last minute, I was just like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And you know what? It was fear. It was fear. I'll be honest. Uh, I know that's, so that's a good point. I I, I like you brought that up. It's, don't feel bad about it, especially for smaller offices like that. If somebody's approached you and you're and you have progressive ideas in your mind, uh, run for it because it's especially if you don't have to raise a million dollars to do it, like do it because you can make you can make a lot of change at the very local level. Uh, when I mean, you it, said run for it, I was picturing like just booking. Down yeah, there. run like get out of your house and run. <laughs> you like to it. about it because that's where the root is. That's where it grows. That's where it starts. And I just like, I was so on the verge and it's like, ah, oh, what are the repercussions of this? Do I really want this much pressure? Because things like that, you're not running, you're not running for, you know, the U.S. Senate or something. You're running for the, these local offices or places where you can really make a difference. You can make a difference in people's lives. So if something like that comes up, then, uh, 
In fact, you know what, Kale, I don't want to talk about that anymore right now because I've got a couple of people we could bring on to talk about that because I think that's that's a bigger, that's a, a quite a big topic um, that we could talk about, about what kind of, you know, good things you can do at the local level. Uh, we just had a very, very good candidate win here in Des Moines uh, on the city council, um, and I'm very excited to see what she's going to do. So uh, we might do an episode just about the idea of why to run for local office and what to do when you win local office. So let's... Let's put a pin in that. Uh, again, like I said, last episode before Christmas. So, uh, Brandon, do you have anything you want to say holiday-wise uh, to the viewing audience? Happy holidays. Controversial statement. Controversial statement. Red cups with nothing on them. By the way, if you're a Christian and you celebrate Christmas, then Merry Christmas. If you're not, then Happy Holidays. If you don't celebrate anything, then I hope you have a good, you know, winter time. Enjoy yeah. Saturnalia. Saturnalia, indeed. All right, guys. Uh, I want to thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Have a great Christmas. Overall, during Christmas, have a good drink. And have a good day.